Oli Palmer, I never stop. And you can <laughs> you don't need to send me any proof. As for the University of the Underground, we don't tend to, you know, um, edit or do things like that. Like we leave it as raw as it can be. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to see you, to meet you, and to actually hear about all the amazing projects that you're doing. Hi, and welcome to the Hold the Space podcast, a podcast about the intersections between creative practice and teaching. Each episode features a conversation between myself, Holly Palmer, and a creative practitioner who also teaches. Before anything else, I would like to update you about this show. There are a lot of podcasts out there that have a whole team producing them, with sound engineers and fact checkers and editors and story consultants and so on. But this is not one of those podcasts. I am the entire team, and it's taken a while to set everything up and get the cogs in motion. But I'm happy to announce that there will be new episodes every two weeks between now and the end of 2023. They will be released on a Friday, just in time for a nice weekend listen. The interviews are a mix of old and new, but I'm really excited about sharing them with you. There are some great guests. I've had some really interesting conversations, which have taken completely unexpected directions, and there have been some fascinating ways of combining creative practice and teaching. I hope that you will enjoy listening to them as much as I've enjoyed producing them. Anyway, on with the show. This is the second episode of the podcast, and what an episode. I was delighted to speak to somebody who I've known for a long time, and whose design work, career, films, and attitude towards life have been a real inspiration to me. That is Dr. Nelly ben Hayon. Nellie has been pioneering her own unique brand of experience design since at least her student days at the Royal College of Art, where she carried out complex scientific experiments on a very domestic scale. I remember seeing her graduation project from the RCA, which she developed with the astronaut Jean-Pierre Hagner, which took a specially repurposed reclining chair, the kind I remember from my grandma's house, and simulated a trip to space for audience members. It was beautiful, bizarre, really funny, and it hinted at the types of projects that would follow in the coming decade, all of which fuse wonder and abstraction with the everyday. Her interest in space has taken her to the SETI Institute, that's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's taken her to the European Space Agency and NASA, where she established and continues to direct the International Space Orchestra. She's collaborated with musical luminaries such as Beck, Bobby Womack, Damon Albarn, the Avalanches, She's created installations, experiences, gallery shows, touring festivals, and she's directed multiple films. Her studio works with commercial companies and organizations on what they describe as large-scale, multimedia, multi-platform, highly ambitious projects. These are sometimes so audacious and require so many moving parts to be aligned that the influential curator Hans Ulrich Obrist once described Nelly as a social sculptor. Crucially for this podcast, she's also taught both on courses such as Central St. Martin's Textile Futures course and as the director of the University of the Underground, the free, pluralistic and transnational educational institution she established in 2017 in a nightclub basement in Amsterdam and whose advisors include influential people from many spheres including Noam Chomsky, Paola Antonelli, Dave Eggers, Massive Attack, Peaches and many more. This biography could go on for some time. I've had to really cut it down. Nelly's an absolute force of nature, but I will stop here so that we can hear her voice. In this conversation, we discuss what motivates Nelly, how she approaches projects from the funding stage onwards, the ethics and the curiosity she embeds into all her projects and teaching, how she thinks about project success, and how everything comes back to Michael Jackson, Hannah Arendt, and Couscous. This interview was recorded remotely in November 2021, which means that some of the upcoming projects that Nelly describes in the conversation have actually already taken place by now. Anyway, I will stop talking now and hand over to this episode's guest, Nelly Ben Hayon. I hope you enjoy this conversation. So I am Nelly Benayoun. 
I design experiences. So I make people lift off from their living room while dark energy is being created in their kitchen sink and sonic boom are exploding in their uh, bathtub. So, you know, this is the kind of the world that I live in, really, like trying to bring in the sublime that exists in science into our everyday. But that's one part of the, the iceberg because most within the past, like I would say, seven years, eight years, the work has been developing more and more within the the resinking or the reshuffling or the challenging of power structure within institutions. So identifying the politics within and the power structures, dynamics that lead to decision making within policies or when it comes to make decisions in terms of economics, politics, uh, sociology, and try to identify what are the systems that are in place and actually challenge them from within through the means of the event. So I do a lot of this and that kind of led me to develop platforms so that others can also experiment with some of these methods, but also to really advocate for what I strongly believe in, which is pluralistic thinking. So the idea of bringing in multiple different viewpoints on the table uh, and actually embed that within the construction of our societies and how we think about power dynamics and we think about decision making again. And then on the other side of that, also building organized community. And that's a very important word to me, organized community. The idea that you're going to build a platform in which uh, you're going to build a network that is going to be uh, allowing for a support group so that whenever you are challenging existing status quo, you're going to find yourself into a sort of a paria situation where you're being left on the side of <coughs> effectively society when you're going against the flow. You get really strong reaction, violent reaction. So it's really become more and more essential to me to actually consider this notion of organized community that support each other and effectively allow you to maintain pressure within these existing systems for the long term. Because I don't believe that you can change things just through the mean of the event. The event or the experience is kind of like the starting point of this uh, conversation. But then in order to really modify it for the long term and for good, you're going to need to act pressure for 10 years, 15 years, like even sometime a lifetime. So you're going to need this organized community in place because it's not going to be a, a solo show, you know? I remember the first time I met you was at the RCA when you were in Design Interactions. And I was really impressed with your bio statement. Was it on the wall or was it Michael Jackson's coat that was on the wall? The first thing that I remember was like, you just went, I love Michael Jackson. And <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah. something in that absolute joy for, for the things that you're passionate about that really is infectious and wears off on other people. And you can see that through the making of the films that you do where, you know, you just went to NASA and just started talking to people. But as you said, it's not just about creating that moment, that funny bit of friction that causes some sort of different dynamic, but you're also really good at building these communities and maintaining these relationships. These things are really lived in. How did you get to a stage where you're able to assemble people around you and make things happen to that extent? I mean, this is an all-in-one question, Oli, because you mentioned Michael Jackson. So, of course, I cannot just pick it up here. I mean, Michael Jackson is not the most popular character right now. So, I guess this is like the perfect starting point to talk about the University of the Underground. We live in very strange times, obviously. There is a lot of patterns that find their way back into our societies that for a long time, we all thought uh, wouldn't find their, their way in. One of the key philosophers or political theorists that I always go back to is called Anna Arendt. Hannah Arendt is a political theorist. She died in 1975. And she wrote this book called The Origin of Totalitarianism, but also another one called The Human Condition. In The Origin of Totalitarianism, it really is about the mechanics that led Hitler to be in power, but also the mechanics that build totalitarianism uh, regime. And with the kind of the core factor of totalitarianism or this kind of specific political regime is an ideology, right? And this ideology is being replicated throughout all of the system of society. So what I found fascinating about this is that 
at some point we are seeing, and now we, we've been seeing it for the past like 10 years, a sort of a resurgence of far-right ideas with Le Pen, of course, Trump, Bolsonaro in uh, Brazil, and there is many other resurgence of totalitarian regimes or ideological regimes that find their way back into politics, right? And with that come the need to, to question ourselves as to what, why is this like that? And of course, Michael Jackson, I'm going back to Michael Jackson now. Yeah. Michael Jackson is just one other example of, you know, something that is also very common in our society now that we call cancel culture. This idea that suddenly someone is being seen as not being popular anymore. So we're going to delete it from all the different channels. Suddenly, Michael Jackson is someone that has been touching kids, has been doing pedophilia. You know, there has been a Netflix TV series about this. Uh, you know, da 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 So with that in mind, there is, you know, suddenly a strong reaction. Of course, it's talking about taboo within societies. It's talking about things that are completely forbidden. And instead of having that conversation about taboo, forbidden, with someone that is actually effectively dead, there is a whole different layer of complexity that, that need to be unpacked, then we just suddenly can sell everything that is about it, you know? And so for me, it's kind of like typically a Michael Jackson, actually, we could totally do a Michael Jackson program at the University of the Underground, typically because it's hairy, typically because it, these are topics that nobody wants to talk about, and typically because it's complex you know, it's not as simple as I'm going to eradicate Michael Jackson from my life or I'm going to stop it from airing on every single channel or I'm not going to do that because that's going to show my support towards pedophilia. Or, I mean, obviously, just be aware I'm not supporting pedophilia. You know, just to make it clear here. Yeah. Uh, but just yeah. uh, within that, like I think there is a moment where we need to speak about these things, you know. Mm. Uh, and so for me, the University of the Underground is a place where we can talk about things like that and we can have these conversations. But to go back to when we met uh, Oli, we met at the Royal College of Art. I was, I think, maybe 21 at the time. And of course, Michael Jackson really impacted my life in a very major manner because when I was a kid and like many other people and many other kids, Michael Jackson was kind of like this alien that you could see on TV when MTV, uh, this channel that is kind of like starting all of video making and music kind of existed. So then you see this guy that doesn't look like anyone else. I mean, from the get-go, it doesn't look like anyone else. He doesn't fit the box of anything. He's neither black, he's neither white, he's black and white, uh, you know, and he's kind of advocating it into his song. He's really um, a problematic character on every single level, you know, because he effectively doesn't rank himself in any category. And he come up with a complete new genre. He danced differently. He's dressed up differently. He's got sparkles all over. And so for me, it was kind of like my first encounter with something that I couldn't pinpoint. I couldn't say this is music. I couldn't say this is performance. I couldn't say this is architecture. I couldn't say this is anything that I knew about. And that's exactly what I wanted to be in a way. I wanted to be that same. And it was extremely inspirational that despite all of the critique, despite all of that, this character or this person was living his life the way that he wanted to live it. So that's also why he kind of like stayed with me all the way through my studies when I was studying design interaction, which is this discipline that was all about looking at technology, new technology, and actually its complex implication into society and how to communicate uh, this future, these potential futures that we will uh, experience in the next few years. So all of these things digested and diluted themselves into the, the work that I'm doing now. And when you speak about how do I do these things, well, again... I learned it from people like Michael Jackson. I learned it from others. You don't actually make these things happen on your own. You need mm. a lot of people to support the mission to actually build this organized community, to be with you along the way. Uh, so there is a vision always, but... Uh, for me, again, being an advocate for plurality, I think there is multiple visions. And in order for these visions to even exist beyond the event, you're going to need to be able to allow for feedback. You're going to need to be able to have many people taking it in different manner, in different ways. That's how I do these things. But to your point, it's really difficult. Yeah. 
it's not an easy path. When you look at the, <laughs> the extent and the scale of the projects that you work on, there's such a breadth, but there is a core that seems to be consistent in terms of a wild, extreme idea and a declaration that something is happening. And then willing that thing almost out of the earth through creating these communities and so on. I'm curious though, because the work really does transcend genres. You were saying about Michael Jackson being impossible to put in the box. I think the the work that you do is really unclassifiable. There's this idea of creating experiences and this kind of thing, but how do you determine if something is successful with work that you're doing? That's a very good question. I, I mean, and only can I just say for our listeners that you have on your bank this amazing like astral wallpaper. <laughs> I don't know where we are. This where is, are we in the house uh, is what is, I want to know. Only. <laughs> <laughs> this is in the basement. I made a little recording studio down here and I spoke to a sound engineer friend and he said, um, like the best thing you can do is get packing blankets and just put them in duvet covers. So it's amazing. Um, I like it because it's really silly and confusing that this podcast is called Hold the Space. And then my background is like space <laughs> in a completely <laughs> different sense. This is amazing. But, you know, I mean, I love the fact that you're in a basement as well. Like the University of the Underground, by definition, is in the basement as well. If you think about Platon and the cave, it's like this is where things are happening. This is where mm. knowledge kind of reveal itself or not, where you are seeking it. And I love the fact that even in your own location, you're like, you're there. So to come back to your question about what is success? Everything I'm doing, when it starts, you have to apply for funding application, right? You need to get mm -hmm. funds to make this project, which are usually at a major scale. So with a major scale commerce or major scale of funding that is required. Mm -hmm. So with that, you always have these questions within the application as in what would be success if you were successful in actually getting the funds, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so usually it will come down to things like, uh, okay, well, you know, I I'm going to get that number of people watching it. I'm going to do this for the community. I'm going to, that a lot, that would be a legacy. But for me, it's always actually where the innovation comes, you know, this idea that what is actually going to make that project last in the long term. So that legacy element is really important. All these projects, in a way, they're really complex to put together. Something like the International Space Orchestra, which effectively, in a nutshell, is to put an orchestra together at NASA, being Algerian, Armenian, French, not having the U.S. citizenship either, and remembering that NASA is a military agency, so to get in is about 95% of the complexity of the project, really. A project like that... To make it happen is something, but to actually maintain it through the years is, for me, the baseline. It's not so much about you can make it happen. Okay, that's a big part of the complexity, but a lot to do with writing, with figuring out the politics, with you know all of that stuff. But really, when it becomes really interesting for me is when it actually allow for critical thinking to embed itself inside an institution for the long term. We started the International Space Orchestra in 20, oh my God, like 2012. So that actually yeah. made me realize that next year is our 10 year anniversary. And we're still going every year. Yeah. There is a new performance. So this year we did an event with Kid Cudi, which is this incredible hip hop artist. We did this thing. It was a music which was effectively about whether or not we should go in space and decolonization uh, pattern. And, you know, to bring that kind of like questioning inside an institution like that is not easy. But we got to a certain point now where we can have this conversation because we've been doing this for 10 years. And so I'm extremely proud to know that there is a new generation coming in at the International Space Orchestra. And there is also the old member of the International Space Orchestra, the one that had been there with me for 10 years. Uh, so that is kind of part of what I would say is success. But I never start a project thinking, oh, this is what we, success will look like. But I do know for a fact that there is some values that really core to what I'm doing and what I want my life to be about, which is making sure that I bring in this plurality inside society, that I can challenge politics, but to a, a top level in a way that really will renegotiate policymaking 
whether it's within environmental context, whether it is within, you know, again, supporting grassroots communities and making sure that there is food in the table at the end of the day, that there is a redistribution of wealth, that we decolonize this institution. That's a big thing for me. Mm. And with that in mind, and I'm speaking on my own self there, I'm not speaking on the behalf of any of the institution I've built, but for me, you know, this doesn't happen peacefully. You know, and I speak on my own behalf. You see, I'm wearing a Longsdale jumper. I'm a boxer as well. I do that. Yeah. And I don't believe that you decolonize and I don't believe that you do these things in a peaceful manner. You know, for me, it's coming back to taking back sovereignty. And I'm speaking about things that are not maybe easy for people to digest. A good friend of mine is Mika White, who is the guy that co-founded Occupy Wall Street. And he wrote a book where he's actually studying how Occupy Wall Street, from his perspective, was a fail. So he's the guy that co-founded Occupy Wall Street, which is the idea mm. of everybody going the street and we kind of speak about wealth and how wealth is being distributed. Now, from an activist perspective, he's been an activist since he's 13 years old. This was the biggest movement ever created in history globally. You know, like everybody was out there saying the 5% shouldn't be the 5% anymore. Now, the reality is like the 5% is still the 5%. So although this movement was moving people in the street, that didn't lead to actually the change that the movement was about. So from his perspective, the reason why it failed is because they didn't take back sovereignty. And so in a flip of the mind, his book is effectively about the idea that actually, if you want to really change things, you're going to have to go after the power and it's not mm. going to be, you know, a smooth ride. Uh, and so for him, his book is going into this kind of violence and understanding of, you know, should we go at war then? Should we actually like really go and take it back where it is? So I'm not going to say I'm one of the person that thinks that you have to go and bring in blood back into the, the perspective. But I think effectively there is an element where, you know, these connections and this revelation of power dynamics are not going to be a smooth ride. So that's, for yeah. me, what is success? Success would mean that actually whatever I do has effectively brought mm. change for the mm. long term within the communities I identified in the per first place. So if I'm going to be working for youth, like I'm doing now with Tour de Moon, which is this nationwide festival, then I need to make sure that there is youth club by the end of this project and that this youth club know of each other and they have a cooperative that I supported so that they know of each other and down the line, if there is another COVID situation, then they can support each other financially. So to still be here to support you down the line in their communities, you know, that is success, for example. Yeah. I think a thing that's really nice about the way that your work operates is that the, the entry mode for an audience member is quite often through something that is either really visually appealing or seems on the surface ridiculous in a really good way like there's a, a yes. like an absurdity to it um yes but then once you go under the surface as i think with both disaster playground and the international space orchestra films yeah. you start out with this small sort of nagging question and can i do this and you think oh this is quite audacious and then you're able to take an audience through the complexity of a series of systems which mm you start picking apart how that power works and yeah. how it's manifests and how to really get to the people who you mm. need to talk to in order to make change. But yes. there's also just this, because you're not turning up in military combat gear, nobody's going, you know, oh God, somebody's <laughs> at the gates who's going to try and upend some sort of power structure. <laughs> but there's this infectious humor that, that everybody kind of buys into and then slowly realizes that, oh, actually what's going on here is something bigger than just mm -hmm. just the actions that are being performed and could have this long-term effect. Um, so I think if anyone who's listening hasn't seen Nelly's work, like massively recommend all three of her films. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. <laughs> or attending any one of her events. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the University of the Underground. I think the last time we met in person was in... Central St. Martins, maybe eight or nine years ago, something like that. I think you just made, or you were just starting to make Disaster Playground. Yeah. So you've been teaching in universities for quite a while as well. But then University Underground has a completely different structure. 
-hmm. How does it work, and how do you do things with students? How do you enable them to bring whatever they're bringing to the table to to show itself? There is so much to unpack because I loved your point that you just made about uh, humor and you know disaster playground and so forth. Maybe we can pick that one up afterwards after yeah. the University of the Underground. The University of the Underground, for the listeners, just to explain them a bit what what it is, it's a free pluralistic and transnational educational educative platform in a way that is based in the basement of nightclub in London, in, in Amsterdam, but now growing pretty much everywhere, everywhere where there is a nightclub that could be a uh, university of the underground. With that in mind, so transnational, just to kind of explain as well the listener what that means, is this idea that it exists beyond national states. So it's got, again, a political agenda in that, but what doesn't in some ways, you know? And I would say agendas with an S because, again, we are pluralistic, so we are all about having multiple different viewpoints just to make things more complicated. But I will say to you that, you know, one thing that I identified quite quickly was like, and maybe it's coming from also my own origins. My dad is uh, born in Oran, in Algeria. My mom is Armenian. And in both cases, also very different type of histories. They kind of migrated, moved, uh, displaced. And they have a very specific relationship to totalitarian regimes and to ideologies in general, because they were impacted by it effectively. And many multiple people are still, you know, are impacted by it. So I have this all a strong mistrust into political party systems and in a way democracy the way that it is let's say in the UK is still not something that I would trust per se that I would trust as being a sort of a fair representation of everybody's viewpoint you know so and I don't know that this is actually a political regime that I support either like I'm much more ranging from like Ocalan if some people are into politics people that speak about democratic confederalism like other form of politics that might not be the one of uh, democracy as we know it right now in, in our society but anyway having said that I realized the way that education is right now, it comes with a national agenda. And that's part of the problem when you think about colonization or when you think about a, a, a big set of systemic you know, racism or a lot of the ill of our societies are back to education and the way that education is being framed. And of course, this education is being framed by political regimes and who is running that political regime at the time where the education curriculum is put together. So, so a big part of the University of the Underground come from this notion that you cannot just run with a, a national educative system. You're going to need alternatives with an S. So I'm not saying it's neither nor. I'm not saying it should be just University of the Underground. I'm saying... All of this should fit together so that if at one point you get uh, another Hitler coming into the pot, then you need to be able to have alternative models so that freedom of thinking is being preserved. So the core of the University of the Underground is to really preserve freedom of thinking and to actually allow for this alternative to exist. And, and in our case, we are very much dedicated to the idea of empowering nightlife because I strongly believe that in nightlife, there is a very strong energy within this counterculture, within that specific demographic that is about reinvention, that is about rethinking the status quo. You know, when night turns up, people transform, even though I'm speaking very big metaphor there, we all have experienced drag shows. We have all, this is the moment where drags wake up. This is a moment where everything changed, where we don't look at things with the same lens. And so for me, nightlife is the place of innovation when it comes to rethinking status quo. So this university is effectively dedicated to empowering nightlife within mainstream institutions and allowing for this conversation to take place and empowering that specific demographic to find their way into these uh, places. So we teach you things like linguistics, semiotics, you know, speaking the same language of the institution is part of the conversation there. We teach you about power and political theory, you know, identifying power dynamics the way that they exist in our society. You learn about events and proper production skills, like how do you put an event together as a starting point of a conversation. You learn about theatrical methodology. So we, we talked about humor, 
humor is at the core of my personal work, but the students are doing many different things. So if I was to give you an example of uh, a student that has been using very interesting methodology, so opera, for example, uh, we had students that have been looking at Deliveroo as a platform and have been looking at showcasing issues within the Deliveroo platform uh, through operatic form in collaboration with the Opera National House, for example. And I'm not going to go into the great detail of each of these projects, but just so you know, we've had students, obviously, music. They've been studying and music and how music can be used to actually speak about uh, the future of the internet at Salesforce, which is, you know, on 90% of the internet and the World Wide Web. We've had students have been looking at literally ice cubes, ice and ice sculpture as a mean to speak about uh, the Middle Passage, which is this uh, key moment within the history of slave and slavery, where, you know, slaves have been taken from Africa to the U.S. And there is this moment where there is a very unique connection to water as a space of non-operation. And so that student has been inventing what he called the Black Arctic, which is a fictive territory that he created, that is a territory that acknowledges, of course, the history of slavery, but is about trying to reinvent the history of Black people away from this system of oppression. So he built that kind of conversation through ice sculpture. So he made an ice sculpture of himself, and he will go around in these places of institutions like the Maritime History Museum or this very kind of like hardcore, historical, uh, I will say, institutionalized spaces and bring this ice cube version of himself to actually enter a conversation with the, the creator of the natural Islamism to speak about, you know, actually the Black Arctic, for example, and say, hey, how about we start to rethink our connection to water perhaps differently or the way that your connection is being structured, uh, but maybe doing it differently again from the perspective of the uh, oppressed as opposed to from the perspective of the oppressor. So things like that is typically type of work that are being done by the student. I have a student, uh, Stoya, uh, who is a pornographer, career artist, and she uh, did a whole project where she was trying to speak about how pornographer artists are connecting to religion you know, or being taken away or being excluded from religious systems. And she did that through the means of fashion, for example. The extent of the body of work that is being developed by our students is exceptional, but also has a real impact in the way that mm -hmm. people think about their system within their community afterwards. I love another project. Uh, sorry, I'm bombarding you with another one, but no, one great, of our thanks. students, Anna, is based in Georgia and she's an activist. She's one of um, the activists that was arrested when they're, they're, they're you know, in Georgia. Uh, there has been this movement that was led by nightclub like Bassiani and others, where suddenly youth went and started to dance in front of the parliament to express their disconnect with the way that the parliament was forbidding homosexual and LGBTQ plus relationship. You know, in Georgia, you're not allowed to be homosexual and you will be arrested to be, uh, you know, homosexual, for example. And so they all started to dance. And that was the reaction. The revolt was to dance. And she was one of the students that was one, one of the you know, individual that was dancing in front of this parliament and then she got arrested. But as part of her project for the University of the Underground, she was looking at a specific uh, character of the Georgian culture, which is called the Kinto. And this Kinto is like a traditional character that has got queer characterization throughout, you know, his way of being and, and acting. And this character is being performed in very traditional operatic institution in Georgia. So what she was doing was to take this specific character and kind of bring it back to the institution through yeah. dance and say, actually, we as a society, through our entire culture, have been building ourselves through that queerness. This is what we've done. This character that we use as a traditional, is like Greek tragedy for Europe. That's basically how strong the Kinto character is. And she started to play it differently and bringing it back to the society, to, to this operatic place. And then he led to a conversation with the director of the opera and then also political diplomats to actually speak about uh, queer and what does that mean back 
through the past history of uh, Georgia and to what it is now. You know, and this fundamental change that has been enacted by our students. And I'm so honored and humbled to actually every single time be meeting with some of these unique individuals that are not going with the status quo, you know? Mm. That's what the University of the Underground is. (laughs) It sounds amazing. I mean, it sounds simultaneously really fun, but also getting stuff done. Yes, Um, that's a spirit. (laughs) Yeah, and then the roster of people who are involved is also sort of uh, ridiculous uh, that the students would have access to so many people. When people join, you mentioned that there's all these classes that they can do for running events and this kind of thing. Is there any particular exercise that you do with students to warm them up or to get them thinking in a certain way that you would... I don't know, get everyone in a room and do something together. When we start a program at the University of the Underground, we will start by explaining some fundamentals about political theory, semiotics, you know. And we do that through an intense day where we literally blast you with all of this different knowledge. And the hope with that is that it's like a recipe. My family, obviously, like couscous and couscous royal is actually you know, actually talking of which this is like a complete colonial invasion of food there. But the bottom line is you have everything mixed up. So you have merguez, you have like lamb, you have chicken, all of that mixed up in the pot with a courgette. Everything is mixed up. That's the baseline of a couscous and the stew of the couscous, right? So what we try to do effectively in the University of Zeno is to start from that baseline. We're going to mix all of this discipline together in a way that you as an individual and your brain, the way you function, is going to eventually land on mixing it up because the confusion is going to be there. So I'm hoping the way that we design or we put together this kind of educative platforms is that they effectively, you you might, you know, as your brain, you're going to get confused. It's like zero gravity. You're suddenly to a new phase where you're not sure you understand this. You're not sure you understand that. You have to land into something that you know, because you don't have any parameters anymore of reference. So you're going to get lost. And effectively, it's a very painful process for the students. You know, you didn't mention this, but we're quite controversial institution, you know. We've had a lot of critiques in the past. I personally, as an educator, have been very much targeted in the way that these critiques have been developed. But anyway, bottom line is, you know, what I'm trying to say here is like, it's very confusing. Going through a program at the University of the Underground is going to be very confusing. And so some people are going to go with that flow and some are going to just say no. I can cope mm. with that and I don't want to. And that's fine. You know, nobody is forced to, to be a part of this process. But I'm going to say to you that it's going to be an epic one where you're going to start by thinking, I'm going to be that person. I'm going to leave being that person. But actually, you, you don't end up experiencing things the way that you wanted to experience them. So it's going to be really strong and the reaction are going to be really strong. And it's going to happen on a very short period of time as well. Uh, whether it's six months or whether it's a two-year program at the University of the Underground, you're going to have so much input and you're going to have so much conflicted input that you, at some point, are going to have to rely on decision making that your brain is going to have to process on its own. So it's a very interesting process to witness. Nobody is really fully in control of the process as it happens. So with that, it's the flux of things. So sort of creating a safe discomfort, <laughs> like turning the heat up and, and really making things happen and then so seeing right. what comes out of that. Yeah, yeah. But I guess it's very similar to my experience, actually, of being a part of the Royal College of Art, for example. When I arrived at the Royal College of Art, I didn't speak English, to be really frank with you. I only could align like six words between each other. The fact that I was selected in a situation like that was in itself a miracle. I still cannot believe that this happened. And itself, that's a story. I, I could tell that story, but I think we wouldn't have the time for, for that. But I would say that I, I couldn't understand English. So... I had to rely on different mediums to actually understand what the lecturer would be talking about or interact with his knowledge. And that would be things like performance, gestures, visuals. And still I could learn. And I think it's kind of like that. Like I think at the end of the day, we're all different. Our brain all function differently. And we all interact with knowledge in a different manner. But at some point, there is some stuff that stick with us. Mm -hmm. 
And it's my strongest belief that by inputting everything into the pot, at some point when you open up the pot, there is that extremely intestinal, visceral, unique taste and stew that reveal itself. And that is what I, I'm interested in, in life in general. Yeah. It's funny with that kind of thing as well, because it's, I mean, my experience of teaching is that people need to find the right thing in the right time and that you can never predict what you could say the same thing to somebody. I mean, not that I'd like saying the same thing to people like 10 times in a row, but <laughs> you, there has to be realizations that people make on their own terms. Yes. in their own way and you can never predict what things are really going to stick and what things are, are not going to stick um, right. and it's it's a really similar process to me to creating something that you have a bunch of ideas you're never quite sure which one's going to hold which things you have to drop and which things you have to focus on and somehow there's a synergy between the internal creative process that you have as somebody who just makes stuff and and tries to make things happen and teaching I was going to ask you, how do you, how do you start with the development of a project? So how do you start the development of a project? Do you know, I had a conversation about that with one of my team members actually yesterday. She decided to leave a project. It's really difficult building this project in general, because ultimately there is a moment where there is always breaking points with an S where it goes, it happens, there is different phases into a project. There is moments where, you know, things are right for some people at a certain time, and then things are not right anymore for some people at another point in the project. And so you have to let it go. And that's one of my strongest um, uh, issue in life in general, is I don't tend to let things go. I don't give up easy, um, you know, when my uncle told me I can never become a boxer because I'm 30 plus and I never did sport in my life and I'm a woman. That was the other point as well. Then I thought, fuck that shit. I'm going to show you I can actually win a trophy and I can be a boxer. And with that's what I did, nails you know, as well. <laughs> <laughs> with the nails, with yeah. the nails as well. You know, uh, we can talk about how you do that with nails as well. But anyway, bottom line is I don't give up on people. I don't give up on love relationships either. I don't give up on anything, on anyone, in fact. So then sometimes it can become really overwhelming, you know, on a personal level sometimes, you know. It's the same with the people that work with you because when you develop a project, then you realize that, there is so many different movable parts and people move around and people leave and da la la. But the one thing that needs to remain is in a way, it's like you. If you are the initiator of the project at the beginning, even though there is a massive crew of people and then you disseminate into many different people, eventually you get there to a certain point eventually. Don't get mm. me wrong. I never want to maintain that there is one person that rule it all, you know, like obviously. But at the beginning, you need to be able to, like you say, this energy has to come from somewhere. And it happens that when I start a project, this energy has to come from my own intestine, you know. So, so you have to you know, you, you have to push it. You have to kind of like get it out there. So, so when someone leaves uh, the project or leave that development, then, you know, you, you need to be able to take this on board without actually feeling too impacted by it because otherwise that energy that you're trying to disseminate and it's only starting to disseminate, you know, cannot go down because there is another team of people that needs to, to still go and still push, 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 so we can build that platform. So having said that, I, I would say to you, like, and sorry, I'm speaking very, um, you know, uh, maybe from the listener perspective in very metaphorical, you know, manner, but if I was to kind of like identify a project and give example, like, you can see how this project, like there is, you know, I will go through an army of different producers. When I do a movie, I never do a movie in a smooth manner. There is a rollout of a team that is can get up to 100 to 600 people that leave, go, come in, leave, go, come in, leave, go, come in. You know, and he goes like, do, 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 
do and it keeps going like you know and the, the intensity just keep on growing and growing and growing and growing but the one thing is it's like endurance i need to maintain that flow you know it's like the water needs to keep on fueling itself and so uh to the to the question about the development i think it has to be an obsession if i was to speak personally uh, and if you're asking me nelly benayun what does it take it takes obsession Yes. If I don't have that at the core of a project, at the beginning, this is not going to be successful. It's not going to go anywhere. And my family knows that. So my family, of course, who knows me the best, know that whenever I get into a monster project, there is a phase where everything I'm going to say to them is not going to speak rationally to people. Or mm. people are going to look at me like I'm insane. Effectively, you have to be insane to make this project happen you have to you have to reach that moment where things are not rational anymore where you know you can make this thing happen but everybody around you is looking at you like actually this woman is never going to make this thing happen you know a good example is when i did the international space orchestra i came back in france and I was talking about it and I was saying, you know, I was with a director of NASA and he was playing the drums and yeah, he had an astronaut playing the kit and then Damon Albon and Bobby Womack turned up and everybody's playing like plouf, plouf, plouf in front of the world's largest wind tunnel. And then as this happens, we also have the vice president of the United States that turn up and kind of make a speech. And then they all speak about the future of space exploration from a decolonial perspective. And everyone is being a part of this and criticizing what has been done to this point. You know, like when you say things like that, like what, what do you expect people are going to say? Like, you're mad. Like you never did something like that. Nobody has, you know. So so then documentation is a big part of it, you know, like making videos, being able to actually document the process and being able to share that process and say, actually, this did happen and this is how it happened. Then at that point, you can start thinking about what actually happened. But until you have documentation, then students will, will offer me flowers and tell me, this is amazing, this story you told us, but they wouldn't believe that I did this thing. You know, when I go in a bar and people ask me what I do and I say, hey, I make orchestra at NASA, I'm taking taxpayer money in the United Kingdom that is being run by the Tory party to actually disseminate it to nighttime workers and news because these people have never got any COVID recovery uh, funds in the past. And I'm doing this through the means of, you know, putting together a festival that is a nationwide festival, things like that. People are going to be like, this woman is insane. So having said that, that's what it takes. It takes a certain level of insanity and humor. Humor, you nailed down before, is essential to my life. Of course, we had a very serious conversation here, but I'm a very funny character, you know, although I do boxing and I can be very violent when it needs to be, uh, I'm, I'm actually really funny. I believe so, at least. I like to laugh a lot. I like to approach everything in life with a certain level of humor and actually question things like, but why is it like that? Why is it that we cannot actually talk about things still with very serious humor, but like actually approach it with that level of Maybe insanity, maybe humor. Maybe all it takes is humor and play. You know, I like to play with things. And that's maybe at the end of the day, what's the most important things in life, just being able to play, to love, to have a, a, a serious level of curiosity uh, as to the way that you approach things, a genuine curiosity where you're genuinely fascinated by others and humans in general, all of them without any level of like, oh, you're more interesting because you're the director of something, then you are someone that is just off the street that will just talk and have a chat to. Everything is fascinating, you know, and everything fits into that big giant couscous pot that we are building all together, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, with the humor thing, I think there's something in the fact that anything anytime that there's humor you have to understand the context of something and understand what it is to have your expectations usurped i mean this is seriously talking about humor which is the least funny thing you can possibly do <laughs> but you've there's something about even a pun where you have to have two images of something in your head at the same time and being able to joke around with something really means that you you are able to untangle and unpick exactly how it's working 
that I think is also driven by curiosity. To me, these things are all mixed up in in a way. And hundred uh, percent, yes. Yeah. Everything has to be connected. I'm not a man says my the last film I did we released it in 2019 and now I'm working on a new one which is called Red Moon which is about my two doppelgangers I have two women that look like me one in Algeria and one in Armenia and we are together planning for the future of if there should be a human settlement on the moon to look like you know and so we are doing this with our respective family but anyway I'm not a monster was a film which is about the origins of knowledge and when I go throughout this film, like I'm literally trying to figure out a way to bring back knowledge to my students in my suitcase. I made that film as a reaction to the critics that we got at the University of the Underground because I wouldn't understand why people would react so strongly against uh, this university uh, at the time. And I didn't have the level of maturity, and I still don't, to be honest, <laughs> that will allow me to fully understand where that was coming from, you know? And so mm. so I was trying to unpack this and this film is really this kind of like start from there, but it's not just the University of the Underground, but it really is about looking from activists, uh, from people that do theater in Japan to people that have been digging Lucy in Ethiopia. So I go all over the world, right? It's like a kind of a journey, five continents, 30 days, a suitcase, uh, you know, and looking for the origin of knowledge with a puppet uh, all around the world with Noam Chomsky, Pussy Riot. You have all of these incredible humans. And I go at them and I say, hey, can you tell me what does it take to think and to think freely at this point in time in the story? What does it mean? And what are the processes by which we can allow others to think freely? That film kind of like unravel all of this. Every time I go and present this film, people are asking me what is in the suitcase. You know, because I come back, the end of the film is, of course, I open my suitcase and then here there is some kind of revelation, right? With Mm. my students at the University of the Underground and everybody is asking me what is inside the suitcase. Mm. And I I think I'm going to just leave this interview uh, by saying this to, to you, like, you know, just to imagine what is inside the suitcase, actually. What is it that we take around with ourselves as we enter a space and we leave a space uh, and as we evolve in our histories as humans uh, before we die? Like, what is it that we take with us and we leave to others, you know? Uh, But anyway, with that, I'm not going to answer that question, but I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you for your time. I'm going to thank also Victoria for setting all of this up. And Yes, um, Victoria so, Adams. <laughs> um, is there anybody else who I should thank or you want to thank? Um, like, oh, my God. That's actually quite funny to talk about that because, you know, like I like to thank everyone on a project. Like I mentioned, there is like such a huge number of people involved in all the project every time. So when whenever I do a movie, for example, the credits are absolutely monstrous. Literally, there is like six minutes or 10 minutes or sometimes 20 minutes of credits. You know, it's mm. like, uh, but yeah, thanking, like I would love to thank you definitely, Oli, for sharing, giving me a microphone, amplifying my voice. You know, I think that's been really helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, th- thanking, like, I don't know, like I, I would thank all of the humans that have been, you know, kind of like coming in and on board of each of these missions and projects as and when, uh, and apologize to them, of course, for, you know, sometime making it really difficult for them, you know, uh, and making it in a way that, you know, sometimes they wouldn't understand or they, they will just, it would come to a breaking point because that's what it takes, like, Every time I reach breaking points with every single human I'm surrounded with, whether it's my family or others, uh, you know, it just is that, like, you don't make this project without that. That just is the way, like, it goes and it's a permanent flow. So I think that, for me, is really important to say, like, you know, you... As you develop this project, it's just being aware that it's endurance and things are going to be epic, I thank everyone for joining that epic journeys.
uh, that life is as we move forward. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. Thanks for going on beyond the, the time. And thanks so much for talking today. It's been just lovely to catch up with you. And <laughs> good luck with the boxing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um... <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Hold the Space. If any of the things we've discussed are of interest, please do take a look through the links in the show notes and the accompanying website at www.holdthespace.art. I've tried to link to as many of the projects and people that were mentioned as possible. Many thanks to my guests, Dr. Nelly Ben Hayun, for generously donating her time to this episode, and to Victoria Adams for helping set everything up. As you know, this is quite a new podcast, and I'm still working out the best way to make the format work. If you have any suggestions or comments, please do send me a note. There are contact details in the show notes and on the show website. Again, that's www.holdthespace.art. I'm going to start publishing these episodes on a more regular schedule, with one new episode every two weeks for this first season. The guest for the next episode is Dr. Barbara Neves Alves, who was for four years a respected colleague of mine, at the Master Institute of Visual Cultures. This podcast is made possible by the Situated Art and Design Research Group at Caret, the Centre for Applied Research in Art, Design and Technology. Each episode is recorded, edited and mixed by me, Oli Palmer. For more information, including full transcripts for each episode, links to relevant work or resources, please visit the podcast website at www.holdthespace.art or the click the link in the podcast notes. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll be back again soon.